Hey, it's your friend and humble narrator Lou Brutus here, and I have been trying to wrap my pea-sized brain around the fact that Pantera's vulgar display of power is celebrating its 30th anniversary. Now, lately, when I've been doing some rock star interviews, I have been asking about the importance of this incredible record. So what you are going to see now is a suite of interview clips with different rockers talking about the importance of the album and Pantera. Brent Smith of Shinedown, Lizzie Hale of Hailstorm, David Draymond of Disturbed, and first up now, Corey Taylor of Slipknot with their thoughts on vulgar display of power. Happy anniversary. Let's talk okay. about vulgar display of power. Can you wrap your head around the fact that it's 30 years old? I no, I can't because I remember, I remember where I was when that album came out, man. I was listening to that incessantly as working at the RV center that uh, my grandma got me a, a job at, you know, because I couldn't, I didn't want to cut my hair and I couldn't work anywhere else, man. So I was washing RVs for nine hours a day during the day and the hottest summer I'd ever felt. And it was, it was intense, dude. And I, all I had was that tape. I had that, I had that tape and one other, it was uh, uh, the Beastie Boys. Uh, so I just kept trading those tapes back and forth. And when I was in, when I needed the burst of energy, I would put in vulgar display. And when I just wanted to, to chill and just kind of get into the rhythm of it, I would put on, I think it was Check Your Head. So it was like those two albums really fueled me that summer to get through it. And I just remember listening to that album and just going, Jesus, Christ, this is so heavy and yet so hummable. Like that's the thing that I think people really lose with Pantera is that it was so incredibly heavy, but the hooks were incredible, dude. I mean, it was like the next evolution of what Metallica had kind of started to do, you know? So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's to this day, it's still one of my favorite albums. And with all the uh, encounters you had with, uh, uh, with the Abbott brothers, what sticks out? Um, oh, God. <laughs> I mean, I could do a book just on the insanity that was hanging out with Diamond Vinny, you know, like... I had so many, I'd so many, I mean, the first time we hung out with them at the, at the club, at the clubhouse, like it was, it was insane. Like you, I, they took us down there and it was almost like they just kind of unleashed us on this. Place. <laughs> and I mean, we were, I mean, it was like seriously like living a TV show. We were just like, I mean, it was absolute insanity. The music was rad. We got so hammered, dude. Like, I mean, like, I barely remember what happened. Uh, that I, I just remember waking up and feeling like someone had kicked my ass. Like, I mean, it was that, that crazy, you know? And Dime was trying, he was doing his best to try and get a uh, clown to like eat like all this crazy stuff. And clown just kept putting him in his place, dude. He just kept going, what? I'll do it. And he just kept going. <laughs> <laughs> it was so, so rad, man. Yeah, it was, it was probably one of the best times we'd ever had after. And they were so cool to us, man, that, yeah, it was, it was rad. By the way, that's one of the most clown things I've ever heard. Oh, yeah, dude. It was, it was crazy. I mean, at one point, he, he did that like raised eyebrow thing, right? He did that sort of, oh, 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 oh. Just kind of, just. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the world of heavy music, though, um, owes a, a, a great deal of gratitude to that album. Um, because if you were to listen to Cowboys from Hell and go back and listen to that and then listen to, I don't know what happened. You know, uh, and I love Cowboys from Hell. It's great. But just the songs on Vulgar and the intent and the attitude and this uh, just, you know, they weren't desensitized to anything. Like every emotion they had was in that record. And they somehow figured out a way to convey 
say it in such a raw, real way where that record saved a lot of people's lives, man. Like that record saved a lot of people's lives. And um, because it was an outlet, that was the first record for me that was an outlet for my anger. Like where like I, I had all this bent up and I didn't know how to release it. And instead of punching a wall and like, you know, breaking my hand and doing something stupid like that, I would listen to Bowie Display of Power and I could I could health in a healthy way, I could get it out. I could get my aggression out. And, you know, I'll never forget in my favorite lyric of the of the whole song. And that that record is purely about strength. And I mean, it just takes on a different attitude on so many levels. And for me, man, I'll be honest with you, when I hear the lyrics in regular people where he says, most regular people would say it's hard, but any streetwise son of a bitch knows you don't fuck with this. I mean, I always was just like, those are some of the most, you know, point blank. Um, those are just some of the most point blank, raw, honest lyrics in the world. What they did for hard rock and really for, for metal, there was a whole different flavor that happened on that album that I think inspired a whole generation of guitar players and and drummers and and front men um I I should I, I should put I think we have that in our record collection out here we should put that on because I didn't realize it was 30 years now um god 30 years it's crazy you know on a actually this year in in a in August it's going to be 25 years of hailstorm <laughs> And I'm like, I'm, I'm officially old. Um, but cause you have, cause you have kids now that are like, obviously, you know, come to the shows and, and party down. And every time I'm like, yeah, we formed in 97. They're like, oh, like, that's when I was born. I'm like, oh God, yeah. <laughs> seriously. But, um, but honestly, to get back to Pantera, um, it's an amazing, amazing album. And um, I, I, I think that there are certain bands that don't that stand the test of time and there are certain bands that that just don't you know like they just make they they make their records but then they they kind of fall in the category of like like the hair band in 89 when everything was kind of over and they were so good but they didn't really like get anywhere and and uh, and these guys not only did they know how to reinvent themselves um but they put together this amazing music and um i was uh I was extremely heartbroken when when Vinny passed. He was a really amazing dude, and he was always extremely sweet um, to all of us. Um, even and you know, man of impeccable taste. First time I met Vinny, um, he was head to head to toe in snakeskin. Um, there was a snakeskin hat, a shirt, jacket, boots, <laughs> and he sang "It's Not You" to me at the top of his lungs in Dallas, Texas, <laughs> in the middle of a hallway. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> amazing but um but yeah so i don't know that the band is near and dear to my heart and uh and i'm glad that it still holds up today we're coming up on the 30th anniversary of uh i don't know if you've ever heard the album before it's really good it's called vulgar display of power yeah once or twice <laughs> yeah yeah you may have heard it uh thoughts on that record and, and why we're still talking about it 30 years later oh god I believe that was the Pantera record that debuted at number one. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Man, what a resounding statement that made at the time. You know, how definitive was it? And just, they really, I think at that point, had honed the whole groove metal thing that they had pioneered. They had gotten to be, you know, so, so perfect at it. And uh, look, I, I that that record was songs we covered, songs we adored, songs that were the soundtrack to many a late night uh, bit of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah on the bus. I mean, all kinds of craziness. There, there was all kinds of moments that those songs are literally part of the soundtrack to our upbringing, and and and. And they, for all intents and purposes, without, and a lot of people don't really know this, but I don't think that there would be a Disturbed without Pantera. I, I, I mean, the band that was Disturbed before me, that used to be called Brawl, um, 
you know, I had a singer by the name of Eric, and he was very much in the Phil Anselmo school. All the stuff that I heard when I went to audition for the Disturbed Guys originally was much, much closer to old school Pantera than it was modern day Disturbed. And it was always, and it was, I was not sure I could even compliment properly at the time. I didn't know if my voice could be as ferocious as the music seemed to call for. Mm. Yeah. But, you know, I told Phil this when I saw him. I think last time I saw Phil was actually in Texas at, he was opening up for Danzig, was super joint, I think, at the time. And I told him that. I'm like, look, dude, you know, I, you know it, I know it. He's like, I learned so much from you, you know, over the course of years. He looks at me, he goes, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> 